Fresh back from Scotland, Quinton Richards. Fre- well, I say fresh back. You're like halfway home, aren't you? This is halfway down. <laughs> That's right. Halfway yeah. down. I, I, I mentioned on the icebreaker, I was there for the North Coast, North Coast 500. And it's the first time since I was a kid I spent any real time up there to be able to take it in outside of the military time I spent uh-huh. up there, which is small. One of the most beautiful places on the planet has mm. to be Scotland, mm. depending where you go. Like Glasgow's, Glasgow City Centre, not so much. Glencoe, 100%. It's, it's got its moments. <laughs> Have you spent much time up there, like in general? Yes, because I met my wife up there. I worked up there, both as an environmental scientist and as a uh, what's called up there an advocate rather than a barrister. So I've spent three years, four years plus working there. Um, and I got to know that the way of life up there, I'd say, both in the city as well as in more rural areas as well. So how much time have you spent up there? Like, talking years? Have you lived oh, there? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I lived up there. From I lived up in Edinburgh from about 1991 through till 94, 5, and then again, 96. I, I then reverse commuted from Sussex up to uh, Edinburgh, Glasgow, and Aberdeen to do court work. D- driving or flying? Oh, flying. I, I could catch the... Cause courts finish at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. On a Friday afternoon, I could leave the Glasgow High Court, get to a Glasgow airport, fly down to Gatwick, get from Gatwick back to my pub, the uh, Rosencrown in Mayfield, in the same time people can get back from London. And, that... it's, and it, well, not too, and not too bad on the price either. With your time spent up there, what, it, what does, how, what do you, how do you feel about the sectarianism up there? Interesting. Yeah, good question. I, I, like I never knew so deeply. I thought it was like, oh, football rivalry, ha ha, and that's about, as, it's like a superficial thing. But it's deeper than it's that, real. right? Exactly, a number of different levels. I remember going to someone's house. This is in Lark Hall, just outside south of Glasgow. I was going to a party on a Saturday night, and I went through Lark Hall itself, and the curbside was painted blue, white, blue, white, blue, white ranges because it's a Protestant village. I thought, oh, that's interesting, the local colour. <laughs> Again, not being totally aware of the circumstance upon which that's predicated. However, when I worked in the courts up in Scotland... And I, I remember speaking to the clerk of the court, the Glasgow High Court, and he'd done an analysis of all the, uh, what are called the serious crimes that had occurred in Glasgow area, which goes to the Glasgow High Court, from 1970 to 2000, which broadly covered the time of the Troubles. And he compared the levels of violence in Glasgow to that of Belfast. Guess which one won? <laughs> no. I, I no promise you. way. I promise you. And then on a personal level, because, you know, I'm, my background, I sound English. You know, I don't sound Scottish. I haven't got Ochtani or anything like that. When I worked up there as an advocate, um, I did my, what they, it's called a pupil, they call it a devil, deviling. So I did a little, you know, apprenticeship. And I was working behind a, the advocate deputy. So we were, we were prosecuting murders in, in the Glasgow High Court. I was a junior. So, uh, sorry, so an adv- explain what an advocate is for people who... An not- advocate is a barrister. The one's wearing the wigs, you know, sort of, you did this, didn't you? No, you didn't. Yes, you did. That kind of stuff. I was the one who's asking the questions. Why are they called advocates? Because the faculty of advocates is, is what is like the original inns of court for the, Sc- the Scottish regime, so to speak. Okay. It's much smaller, and you all have just one big team, one scrum together, as opposed to lots of chambers. So, sort of advocate is a Scotland-specific term in law? Correct. It's, it's, it's basically the Scottish barrister. Okay, got it. Right, there we go. Yep, 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 yeah. okay. Who have rights of audience in the High Court where solicitors don't. And what's the difference between a barrister and a lawyer and a solicitor? A solicitor doesn't necessarily have rights of audience in the High Court. A barrister has rights of a court in every court of the, um, ju- the judicature. I, from the bottom end, magistrates all the way up to the Supreme Court. <laughs> a lawyer can. A barrister can. A, a barrister can. A solicitor doesn't necessarily have rights beyond the county court. Okay. What I'm about a bit a rusty on this now. Because what about a lawyer? A lawyer is just a generic term saying, you know, in, in America, they've got a few system where solicitors and barristers are one and the same. You can be either a trial lawyer or a non-trial lawyer. It doesn't make any difference. You can do both, albeit you don't want to start stepping outside your competence in any circumstances. But in England and in Scotland, that's not the case. So we have this old-fashioned system that some people say, well, that's double trouble, double cost. What are you getting for it? I've got... Um Two like lawyers in the family who, who who listen and are currently ripping the hair out. Going, you should know this. You should know this. <laughs> okay, I understand that. Right. Yeah. So back to Scotland sectarianism and the story you're on. Yeah, and then what I found, I was because I'm, I'm I'm sort of seen as be a Sassanac. I'm English, sort of my you know, accent. I'm sort of public school and all the rest of it. And I remember working with this one advocate deputy, 
And she just started tripping me up in the court case, which I thought, I thought we were on the same side. In fact, on the very first day, I thought I had shit on my feet. You know, when someone looks at you and goes, you thought, what's going on here? And at the end of the day, I thought, well, at the end of the first day, I thought, I said, look, if you clearly don't want me, let's just call it quits and, you know, you get somebody else in. But we couldn't because you're this on two weeks stint. No, this is the advocate deputy, the senior prosecutor, and I'm the junior prosecutor. And you're working for her. Correct. On the same side. Absolutely. Okay. And then I realized it took me about a couple of, about three days to work. So I was asking a few friends, what, what's going on here? And essentially, she was female. She was a QC. She was female. She was Catholic. She had come from, in, basically in certain terms, I'm from the wrong side of the tracks as far as she's concerned. Yeah, really, really, really odd. I then got told by the, one of the solicitors in the, in the Glasgow High Court that I would not be instructed by 30% of the solicitors there because I was deemed, seemed to be English. So to some extent, I know what it's like, what racism is like, because I, not that I gave a, blind, gave a damn about it, but the idea of some people will choose a particular route because of what they perceive you to be, I got the rough end of the stick on that one didn't bother me too much. What I realised, I wasn't that much good of a barrister anyhow, because I couldn't understand what they were saying. Do you remember Rab C. Nesbitt? <laughs> I actually used to learn Scottish. Now he's being racist. No, not at all. Not at all. I've got Scottish blood in me. I'm a mongrel. I've got Irish, I've got, I've got English, Scottish, Welsh, you know, I've got yeah. the whole lot. Um, same here, same here. Yeah, so... Not English, though. Oh, <laughs> not at all. Just cat. And, um... Sorry, I forgot, lost my track of the threads. Right, you couldn't understand what they were saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I remember one case in particular. That I, I guess I had to take notes because the senior prosecutor would be asking the question. I had to write down the notes. And they get, and you'd, you could choose the lineup of which witnesses you wanted to take first. And you'd get the ones who were serious alcoholics in early before they got the shakes. Because when they got the shakes, they were useless to be able to even answer questions because they wanted to drink some more to stabilise. So 10.30, the court kicks off. And you, they, in the Scottish system, you don't have a lot of preamble. You literally just say, what's your name? John McTavish, where do you live? Da, 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 and you just start giving your story. And because it was all connected a bit like our system is here, we got, you know, had, mic had a microphone and they had a podium or the witness box. It was relatively new technology then, relatively speaking. And you had the microphone, it'd be like that. And these guys would start shaking because they had the DTs. Yeah. And the microphone would start going... Bub, 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 bub like that and it just reverberate around the courtroom <laughs> and sometimes you, you, people just lose it and you, you, you couldn't you couldn't get the person to say what they needed to say I mean, it's funny but it's not through. funny it's funny but not absolutely funny. Yeah, yeah, yeah. but the, 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 the sheer arbitrary lives that some of these people lived under which the circumstances of these crimes have been committed was quite eye-opening just the sheer randomness of some of the murders that actually took place and then some of them of course were actually under the sectarian issue going back to that you'd have different mafia groups different groups and we'd take some time to invest. Well, if, if the case wasn't going well for particular reasons, like the evidence wasn't coming up to scratch, as it should have done, and we'd really, what basically we'd find out someone had been nobbled or whatever it was, and then we'd have to take a decision with the procurator fiscal, which is the equivalent of the CPS, as to whether we continue the trial or fold it, because we might lose other things which were other pending aspects of further investigations which would then lie upon whether this evidence came out or not. So there was more, a more complex picture than just the actual prosecution as we saw it. And some of this thing was quite sectarian based. That's, that's about as far as I understood it, but of course I wasn't privy to all the information that the Procurator Fiscal themselves were, were aware of. Because the advocate deputy is just the, you know, the speakers of the, of the case. They hold the case and they have to, you know, responsible to the court. Whereas the Procurator Fiscal has a much bigger duty <coughs> in the public interest to bring you know, certain things to, to, to the court and make prosecutions. Mm. It's, uh, I, <clears throat> the reason I asked is about it is because <clears throat> uh, we were talking about heritage. Like, well, I've got an Irish mother, yep. as in proper island, right? <laughs> which, uh, but, which, but, one's the, which one's the other island? <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the northern island, the one with the rubbish accent. Oh, okay. Island, yeah. <laughs> Can't say. Um, but I, I, like, we, we live in such a, so cure people in the UK generally I think unless you've unless you spent time like in Scotland or in Ireland for whatever reason, mm. I think most people would if you explained that story to them mm. and said, "Yeah, I they were like they didn't want to work with me yeah. because of my essentially what they perceive my religion to be, yeah. essentially what it is, yeah, or my yeah. not, not even religion denom denomination, yes, like exactly. Protestant Catholic, same God. Say, that's assuming you're a religious person, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. 
So uh, they wouldn't work with me because of that. Yeah. I don't think pe- most people would believe you. Yeah. Because like, that happens now. Yeah. You think, what, 2020, 2022? No. God, yes, that's how it is. Yeah. Like, I don't know the religions of 99.9% of the people I work with. And I don't give a shit. Mm. I don't, I literally don't care. And yet across, you know, a, a couple of hours drive or less than an hour's flight, and yeah. you can go into somewhere where if you, if it, if they know you're of a certain denomination. Bang. Yeah, bang, closed down. And probably treated worse than what, um, uh, like, uh, like a, a Muslim could be treated. Absolutely. I argue that a, a, a Protestant would treat a Muslim better than they would treat a Catholic yeah, yeah. person in certain areas of Scotland or Ireland. And that's crazy. I'm not saying mistreat Muslims. I'm saying treat us all. <laughs> what no. does it matter? What does it matter? Yeah. It's bonkers. And it's, I, I was talking to her, in fact, not too far from you actually, where we're sat right now. I was talking to someone who's a Northern Irish guy and he was um, saying that the situation in Northern Ireland at the minute is getting really serious. I'm not sure if you're aware of any of this. I am aware of super it, yeah. serious mm. and is a, a real severe risk of it escalating or it is escalating towards the point of it's going to be pre like Good Friday Agreement stuff. Mm. Crazy, crazy stuff mm. going on. Mm. And again, we're just completely, completely isolated from it. Mm. And it's not much reported on. It's sort of, it's all, it's all being kept in house at the moment over there. And that's like, we don't need that right now. We've got enough problems going on. Absolutely. You know, energy crisis, Ukraine, Russia, yeah. America. Yeah. Uh, what else? What are the, oh, UK regime change. Liz Truss. Again, you know. <laughs> <laughs> let's not go down that rabbit hole give it a chance let's not go down that um, right I wanted to ask you about this you mentioned Nicola Sturgeon on the on the early stuff icebreaker yeah now not yeah so you were talking about a policy that they were they being the Scottish government were talking about bringing in or are bringing in about monitoring how, how a parent brings up a child that's essentially elaborate right. on that for me well, they, it's gone, that sounds it, it, crazy. It, it is. It's, it's gone. It's gone back to sleep again now because it was got knocked out as being unconstitutional in the widest sense of the word by the uh, court of session. This is about it's about a year old case now. A year ago since the the the, act, the the decision was made, but essentially for a period of time, the family friendly SNP had the idea of everybody should have, I mean, so every junior person, every youngster should have the chance for getting an equalised, you know, upbringing that's good you know, <coughs> to get access to the right things. But in order to find out whether they're being deprived of certain things, you need somebody to know whether that's the case or not. That was, that, that's their rationale. So they introduced the idea that every youngster in Scotland under 16 or whatever should have a duly appointed sort of municipal person appointed by the municipality to be responsible for ensuring that, that those children get what they're meant to get, either access to better education or, you know, so on and so forth. Now, in some respects, you think, well, that's a rather well-meaning and good idea. Sounds good. Yeah. However, actually, it comes back somewhat to a, to a religious question as well, at a deeper political and religious <coughs> point, is that who's responsible for the children, ultimately? And the answer is the mother and the father albeit there's, there's good arguments for making say, well, actually, the state also has an interest, la, la, la. But in terms of straightforwardly who is there doing it, it's the parents. So this obviously created a rather a, a division in, 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 in sorted the sheep from the goats out, basically, those who would say, yeah, that's a good idea, and those who, who didn't. However, my reading of what they were seeking to do was quite similar, although it's well-meaning, to what um, the Nazis did in 1933, which is they had created what's called the Gleichaltung, which is they, in every sense of trying to make, they make parallel organisations to all the existing civil society, such that you had a chess club, you'd have the Nazi chess club, you'd have the children's, you know, what do they call running club, you'd then have the Nazi running club. So youth club. And yeah. Youth club, et cetera, et cetera, <coughs> right across. So what it was aimed was the atomization of the family life. That's what it was aimed at doing. Uh, both intention, the atomization. Yeah, the atomization, the breakup of the family position. So, breakup of you know, okay, within, yeah. within a family, you've got mum, dad, kids, and that's a nice nuclear time. family. Nuclear family, yeah. that's it. And the aim was to intersect the Nazi ideology at every point to break up those primary relationships. For what reason? So that the support was for the Fuhrer alone. That was it, an undivided loyalty. And to, to reduce to, independent thought? Absolutely, yes. Okay. That, but in terms of the paralleling of that with what the SNP was seeking to do... Is that putting you off? That noise? No, not at all. No. No, I'm just trying to make sure I'm precise in my language. 
I'm, I'm just I'm conscious of there's a tournament out, outside this yeah, no, outside no. the studio about no. ten meters away. It's all, okay, yeah. I, 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 I'm treating this all as supportive. Yeah, <laughs> for anyone who can hear clapping and cheering, it's, it's not for the podcast. <laughs> no one can see us. We're in a box next to a rugby tournament that's going on that I did not realize was going on when I timed this interview. Anyway, Quinton, yeah. continue. Sorry. So, <laughs> so hope what what so so some of the corollary or the ramifications of what the SMP was seeking to achieve necessitated potentially breaking those or interfering with the, what we consider to be a boundary of the family thing within which the family sits in order for the aims and purposes of this particular piece of legislation to, to actually take place and get, get results. They got a knockback a couple of times from the High Court and then there was a final one, I think, last last time. I don't, think it, I don't think it went to the House of Lords Supreme Court, whatever it is. <coughs> Ultimately, it stayed in the Court of Session. But and then finally, there was an admission of grace, a graceful defeat by the by the SNP government on that particular point. Of course, this is not the kind of stuff that most people in England are terribly interested in. You know, it's a it's a Scottish exercise. But coming back to sectarian point, because those who are there, there's a certain thing that I think, from my understanding of the way Scottish civic life seems to seems to take quite often takes place. Looking at it historically as well, is that there is an element of we can do better, and we can do better than you. And who's better to tell you than we? But who is that we? There's less of that that sort of stuff here in, 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 in England, although I think, you know, generally speaking, there's a lot more of that. You can almost see that some of the behaviours of people who say, you can't do that any longer, as being much more manifest, as people used to say, it's none of your business, and that would be the end of it. And I think much more people accepted the idea of this collective imposition on people to do various things that which other people decided as opposed to the freedoms which one's chosen for oneself. Now, without sort of breaching too many more, sort of causing too many other ways, I think to some extent the way that the SNP or Nicola Sturgeon backed that for so long didn't actually do her any favours because I can't see how those people who are considering, if you're trying to help family life, how you want to help family life the way that families want to be helped that they themselves have decided, rather than saying, well, we know better than you. So it's really it's one of those balancing acts, I think. Mm -hmm. Whether she continues to do that in the future in different ways, I do not know. But you know, that's up to the Scottish electorate to decide for themselves, isn't it? On the subject of, OK, law, and you're, you're a constitutional lawyer, right? Back, background, yes. I used, to, I used to practice. I used to do some... I did one or two cases, yes. Did... Uh, what has the impact been on that for that being law and general constitutional law from Brexit, would you say? P positive or negative, would you think? I don't think I understand your question. Could you ask it again? Please? So our so constitutional law, our laws yeah. over here are yeah, quite yeah. heavily influenced. Oh, no, not, not quite heavily influenced. Can be heavily influenced in certain areas by when we were part of the EU, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Has there been much of a change since our departure? Um you may not know the answer. No, I don't know. I, it's I, just do, I, was, I, was, I was quite involved with some of the... When, when the shenanigans were going on in Parliament with uh, Speaker Burko doing, creating new rules about the way that Parliament should operate its own internal rules of procedure, I was um, instrumental w with other people in order to bring to light certain of the, what I'd say, the aspects of, the, of what he was seeking to achieve and what the outcomes were that were... We're, we're, we're beginning to come to light. I was there to. I wrote various pieces that sort of suggested this was not the right way to go. What was he trying to achieve? It was odd in certain respects because they weren't any <coughs> long-term objectives. It all seemed to be sort of well, we want to be able to stop just stop things happening. But of course, this was with the. But by the same at the same time, dissolving precedent so that the way that they should have behaved in order that the rules to be. To work, they have they, they've been worked out over many centuries. Some of them are good, some of them are bad, but it works as an as, as as a set of mechanisms that allow basically the government to exert its will through Parliament to achieve certain legislative ends as uh, within a, a democratic ambit. And what seemed to be doing was certain overthrow of some of those procedures, which would otherwise have provided the government with the with the right. The, with the means to achieve its ends, hence the election we had in 2019, which is all about who the hell's going to control this. So measures that would reduce the power of 
Joe Public to bring no, not that. I'm saying okay. the Parliament parliamentarians themselves in in their own in their in their own room because there was a, there was a, a cabal basically of parliamentarians who decided that they would not wish to continue. Well, whilst the government has a certain you know set of requirements, and they said this is what our policy is, and things like that, they weren't allowing things to happen. And I think most of the arguments, which became quite abstruse at times, but it occupied a lot of airspace and a lot of you know copy etc. to achieve. Um, meant that we were in, in danger of some of the, under, the underpinnings from, from of our the, const, the, the parliamentary constitution to actually be broken up. And this, I was fearing that. Um, and consequently, I got involved at certain times. I was sort of talking with various people, like uh, there's Martin Howe, who's very well known in this area, and him and I, I, him and I discussed certain things at certain times with some with other people to help make sure that the right set of procedures were retained in order just for the, the system to actually operate properly or for it to continue because it seemed to be in a stage of complete chaos and stasis um, and then but in the wider sense of how, how the effect of things happening how things happening now I think the boat's writing itself broadly speaking I mean subject obviously to the Northern Ireland Protocol not being being a bit of a stick you know stick in the wheel at the moment um, but I think that, that the, the political situation on that one is is one where, as you've alluded to, that is is, is tricky. Needs to be. It's like a, a boy that needs to be lanced somehow. Mm. Uh, so coming back, so the Speaker of the House then actually yeah. has quite a bit of power. It's not Massive. a superficial. It thing. was what really hadn't. No one had even thought about it. I mean, thinking, oh yeah, the Speaker does this. That's it. Not realizing he had actually untrammeled powers. Except, I wrote a piece that suggested that the early writers about this like Edward Coke and there was some other other Bacon and Lord who's a Lord Chancellor back in the early sixteenth <coughs> century. That um, in fact when the parliamentarians are acting as judges about their own procedures, they can't act as on behalf as representatives of of their the people who voted for them. They have to act as judges, which is a slightly different concept. And he's going, mm, what do you mean, Quinton? What do you mean, Quentin? Yeah, what do I mean? <laughs> um, it's this, uh, is that you have to be much more constructive or the, the construction you put upon what rules you say how they should operate have to be not what you would like them to be, but what they actually are. So you can't put a positive spin on it and say, I would like them to be like this because it's helpful to me in this particular way. Can you give an example? <clears throat> okay, I'll get. Uh, I'm pretty easy using the American Constitution just because they, they use a lot. There's a lot more talk about that in the public press. In the press, there's two wings of discussion about the Supreme Court in the United States. One is that they have what's called the originalist view of the interpretation of the Constitution, which is that as it's stated there, like that, that's how you've got to interpret it. Hence, like the latest stuff about um, Roe and Wade being, you know, sort of overturned, and everyone going hoopla about it. The present constituted Supreme Court has decided in, um, using a, an originalist interpretation that Rome Wade could not be decided as being, an, as, as being a right under the Constitution because it wasn't even written about. It wasn't explicit that you can have an abortion. It never says that in the thing. And so they say in the 18th century, those, the people who framed the Constitution would never even thought about it. Therefore, you can't therefore use that as a basis for continuing with Rome Wade. And that's why they overturned it. Whereas the constructivist in, con in contrast, the other ones say, well, this is what they would be doing now if they were in this position. And it's, th and it's that kind of approach which is actually bedevils a lot of what was going on about Brexit. It's what people wanted it to be in terms of constitutional change, either what Berko in particular and his cohorts, and I use that in a certain sort of uncharitable fashion, obviously, because there were certain people who were <coughs> on both sides of the aisle who were seeking to continue to, to just to break up the way that the government was seeking to to achieve the you know the aims un, un, under the uh, legislation that's being brought forward so and in fact judges are meant to not take put a positive spin and say what we would like it to be but to what it actually is what does the actual written word actually say much more strict in the interpretation so i mean i must admit, i haven't i'm not having dealt in this area for a while now i'm quite rusty on it so i'm <laughs> no, that's right. I put you on the spot, didn't I? You did. I put yeah, you on the you spot. Did, yeah. <clears throat> I mean, on that point, so you have, to my knowledge, mm. so far my knowledge, yeah. barrister, yes. constitutional lawyer. Well, that's the same thing. Same thing. Yeah. But, uh, but I know that now. I, I do some good crime as well. Yeah. 
Uh, he did some what? Crime, good crime. Oh, crime here, sorry. Yeah. sorry, sorry. Uh, environmental scientist and a chef. Yeah. Right. Was the environmental scientist before or after the barrister? Before. Oh, really? Mm. Go on. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I, I mentioned that... I just know. had Ben Pyle on. Uh, <laughs> are you aware of a guy called Ben Pyle? No. Uh, he's a, uh, he's a, f- a founder of... Uh, oh, God. Climate... Climate resistance. I so, really should know, shouldn't I? My, my wife's a pretty green not, person. Oh, okay. Well, he's not green. Oh, he's not green. So he's an, an, no, anti-green, I'm anti-green policy. I'm, yeah. I'm green. I'm grey. Grey? Yeah. Because for, cause I basically, when I did three years at university, I managed to stick it out. Um, basically, I learned about the fate of, of chemicals You didn't finish uni. You didn't finish uni. Oh, I, I, I fell out so many times. I told you I had, I had a very low threshold of boredom. Yeah. So my first 10 years after leaving school, I just bounced around. And then I realized I was going nowhere very fast. So I finally ended up university for the third time. And most of my family and friends were taking a book out on how long I'd actually stay. But I managed to stay for three years. And, but I learned about the fate of work chemicals in, in the environment. And for every choice about an, a chemical change, you get a different result. So that's why I call myself a grey, not a green. Because there's no one orthodox way you can actually say that this is better than that. In, at least in the terms of the chemicals that I understood within the cycles of the, whether the carbon cycle, the sulfur cycle, and so on and so forth, about five major cycles. Consequently, um, and there's also this idea of can we totally decarbonize? I have a certain philosophical problem with that, only on the basis is that we live within a carbon universe. We don't live within a sulfur universe. And people say, well, so what? The answer is, is that you can't really, you know, the reason why we have the structure that the uh, world the way it is, is, the, is that carbon has a valence of four, and that makes it able to com- create complex molecules. Now, complex molecules not are a sin in themselves, because it's the way they break down subsequently, and where the chemicals go off to, sub- you know, off to that. So I'm basically much more relaxed about the problems of human impact on our environment, which in itself is a dynamic interaction but not necessarily in a non-linear fashion as the way some people would like to see, or would fear or hope to see. Like the end of the world is now in about 2030, because all of a sudden the invariance in the, or the variance in the changes that are going all suddenly go snap out into another metastable change, which will mean everything's going to collapse. I think that's not for the birds, but I haven't seen any major changes in the variance, the increase in variance, which you'd normally see in a non-linear, non-linear system, which the Earth actually is in its, in, in its different aspects. You're thinking, yeah. okay. Now I'm thinking. No, I'm not thinking. I'm, I'm just. <coughs> I'm. In, I'm in, like very much. I don't know. I probably just, just describe myself as grey at the moment too. Like I'm just trying to okay. inform myself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I also. I like one of the things that's sticking in my mind at the moment. Not sticking in my mind. One of the things I think about at the moment. When I'm trying to go. Okay, have we got a major issue? or Have we not? And one of the things that one of the things I think is what are the people who have got the power or the money or the ability to understand what is going mm-hmm. on and the foresight to go on, what are they doing mm-hmm. compared to what is being said is possible, possibly going to happen? Yeah. And one of the things I remembered, um, I remembered over the last few weeks, it has to have been, it must have been 10, I mean, 20, 20, yeah, but 10 years ago, 10 years ago, there or thereabouts, so I was working away, I was doing a lot of time just doing stuff. So I, re- I remember when I would have thought this and when I would have read about it because I had a lot of time to read. And I remember reading that because of global warming and because of the climate change, that Bangladesh, Cape Town, it was Bangladesh, Cape Town, and somewhere else, I might have been, I can't remember the other person, place was, they gave these three examples that stuck in my mind, there are more examples than that that they were, in the best case scenario, they were going to be underwater mm. by 20, 2020-something. Yeah, yeah. By 2020-something, yeah. right? Now, I'm not saying that's not going to happen, right? Because it could be beyond, it could be between now and 2030. But yeah. what I do know is, there's still businesses there, and there's still people there, mm. and there's still governments there, mm. and there's still uh, very rich people there, and there's no one fleeing. If that is the case, even if there was like a, Let's say it was a 5% risk. Let's say I thought 5% risk is the worst case scenario happened. These places are going to be yeah. underwater. Oh, that's, that's, uh, uh, be, sorry, best case scenario. Mm. That these places are underwater nowhere else. So it's, you still move. But people are still there. Everyone's still there. Mm. It's like, there has to, there's, somewhere, things are being exaggerated. Mm. That, that's how I think at the minute. I think, 
Like, this is my, if I was to summarize my opinion on it, because I'm just really conscious at the moment I had someone who was completely anti green on, right? Mm. Which kind of, so people would think, oh, Hugh must be anti green too. No, not yeah. necessarily. Yeah. I'm just trying to inform myself. Like, if I was to summarize it, I think, okay, I think generally things have been over dramatized. I mm. think the risks are being way inflated and people are claiming to, uh, to, uh, really uh, understand really well and really specifically what's going to happen when it's actually a super complex thing that is pretty much unpredictable unless you have got the ability to look at uh, millions and millions of data points over hundreds of thousands of years mm. I wish we'd, and then have a system that is capable of a computer system analyzing it and going this is what's going to happen we can't predict what the weather's going to do next week we, beyond, we can't, beyond five days, it's, it's out, it's it's out of touch. Days. It's like fifty percent, right? Yeah, yeah, it's like they know fifty-fifty next week what's going to happen, yeah. and 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 yet we're saying this. Yeah, all this is drama is going on with with the environment, all the rest of it. Mm. There is absolutely human impact. Mm. In my mind, is I think the human impact is very much less than what they say it is. Mm. The catastrophes are very unlikely to happen. Yeah, but I mean that's as skeptical as I would go with it because mm. you have to accept. Everyone has to accept. Like you don't know all the pieces of the puzzle. Absolutely. You don't know all the pieces. There are people that do mind, I think. There are enough pieces of the puzzle to be mm. able to say, we don't know what the fuck we're talking about. Mm. Let's just be as clean as we can, as green as we can, mm. um, at the same time, allowing ourselves to be as efficient and uh, enabling growth and not giving people shit lives at the moment. Yeah. Like I don't see necessarily we should be having an energy crisis right now. I don't see necessarily that we should be moving towards like decarbonization in inverted commas by 2030. And also, that's not fucking possible. It's not possible. I know. It's a sick, it's a bluff. It's a complete bluff. And and I mean, going on a tangent here, like any, <coughs> I really think at the moment, right, with with heads of state, PMs, presidents, mm. when they put a strategy in place mm. that goes beyond the possible duration of time that they are going to be in power for, mm. they are talking, probably talking, absolute rubbish. Mm. They haven't looked at it in depth. Biden or, or Johnson at the time, and I trust, say in 2030, 2035, 2040, they don't care. Like, I, I, I really think they're that, they're that uh, shallow with it. They don't care. They're yeah. doing what they think is going to work for them now to maintain the power. Yeah, it's, it's polite society terms. It's depressing, that was. Sorry. No, no, that's, I, 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 I don't disagree with anything that you, you said. And I couldn't really enlarge upon it in any better way. We should reuse plastics. Like, we should reuse plastics. We should reuse, reduce the use of fossil fuels. We should reduce plastics. We should recycle as much as we can. We should conserve as energy as much as we can I think within there's, reason. But there's a, yes, but there's a lot of ritualistic stuff behind this as well. Go on. Okay. All the plastics, for instance, which you say we're going to recycle and things. I used to be involved in a somewhat slightly early life for my environmental science. I created a novel methodology for the restoration of gassing landfill sites in the UK using pulverized... Restoration. restoration. Old, ganf- old gassing landfill sites, which equate to a third of all... <coughs> all the amount of you know, methane's the baddie in, the, in, this, in, this, in this game. A third of all th- methane emissions in this country come from old landfill sites. One third. One third. Go Jesus. to the old DEC statistics. That's where it's. Is at. that just from bio breakdown? Yeah, exactly. Because we put our rubbish into a big mound and then <coughs> put a bit of soil on top. And basically, what would happen? Rain would come in and dilute it. It's called dilute and pollute. That was the design process previously, as opposed to containing it. So those ones, you know, and the rubbish sort of you know goes <laughs> produces gas and things like that. Breaks down and gets all kind of other chemicals, pollutes to groundwater and gases to atmosphere. I created a method. It was, I wasn't really looking at it. It just happened out of something else I was doing. I recognized the pulverized fly ash from old um, coal-fired power stations, which is made, um, you know, breeze blocks and things like that. Most of it goes into, it's inert material. It goes into the, you know, back in, backfilled into gravel pits and things like that because they don't have full use for it. But the chemical composition of pulverized fly ash is pozzolanic, i.e. that when you add free lime, it turns into concrete. <coughs> So I thought, hey, we've got a lot of waste stuff coming from power stations. I'm talking about this is back in 10, 8, 10 years ago now when I developed this. Because I actually patented this. Not thing. that long ago, though, really. No, not that long ago, when all the power stations were still working, when they've all since closed down. And we were producing about 6 million tonnes of pulverised fly ash per annum. Pulverised? Pulverised fly ash, PFA. That's what comes out of power stations when you burnt the coal. Fly ash? Yes, yeah, fly, fly ash. Okay. And, you just, it's, it, and basically, you add free lime and bang, it turns into concrete. So I thought we could use that. Put that lid, big landfill sites, so you can stop the water coming in, and then you trap the gas, all of the stuff underneath, and that turns into a gas reservoir. You yank the gas out, 
use that, which is methane, you use that to pre-treat green waste in two stages called torrefaction and then gasification. Torrefaction is like a junior version of turning to charcoal. You know, it's a low temperature drying out process. <coughs> and then, then that produced, then you, the gasification produces heat and electricity. And that was the, the cycle. And that's what, I, that's what I produced. And I introduced that to, I actually introduced it to the Treasury. This is in 2009. And they were just deciding EDF and the others because it was a great moment because they were going to change the level of taxation on waste from, they were going to redescribe that inert stuff instead of it being inert and would only be a, attract a tax of six pounds a ton. They're going to turn it into intermediate, which would be 38 pounds a ton. And all of a sudden, the EDF and all the rest of the crew were not happy bunnies because they were going to, they had no other way to, of where to put it, except in the ground and pay the tax. I had a way of being able to reuse that in a, in a, in a, in a beneficial fashion and reduce the major things of, you know, the so-called baddies in our environment. Everybody going on at the moment about cows farting and all the rest of it is just fart. In comparison, you, know, you can do something about these landfill sites. Like Kent has over 50 landfill sites, probably about which between five and six, as I recall, were real major, major up into the sky. Like Tunbridge Wells one, they even did a little mucking around and tried to abstract some gas and they vented it off and you know, burnt it up a bit. But we could have actually produced quite a lot of, you know, uh, two different cycles using green waste and the gas coming from these landfill sites to produce <coughs> electricity and heat. But it does require a certain degree of, say, overview and a number of things coming together at the same time, which um, didn't, didn't, it didn't occur. And um, so that came to naught. And, of course, as they started reducing the amount of pulverised flash, the whole idea went, you know, tits up anyway. So, is, so all the technology to implement that method was, is in place? That exists? It's, it exists. Yeah, it's, it's basic stuff. It's, not, it's, it's just a new way of doing something. And, in fact, the, I got phoned up i got this really weird email this after i just the thing sort of we'd stopped doing it i got an email <coughs> from chelyabinsk in russia from who chelyabinsk it's a place in russia it's one of the most polluted places on the planet and it used to be in, a, in the oblast that was controlled by who's the football the guy the guy who used to own chelsea football club roman abramovich Ab abramovich he used to be the governor of this chelyabinsk region i got phoned up by the ministry of foreign whatever it was Ministry of Interior and Industry or something like that. And they said, oh, you've got this thing? And I said, yeah, okay. Um, and I, I've got friends who work in the security industry. And I said, look, is this, is this person real? And yes, he was real. And he said, we'd like you to come out and uh, do some things for us because we've got a lot of stuff we can reuse, la, 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 la. And he, I said, so what, would you, what do you want me to do? And he said, well, we'll speak to some people and we can sort of get things going and, and it'd be to introduce me to various people to help do the things that got there. I took a view on this one, is that you didn't want to end up dead. <laughs> what year was this? 2012. <laughs> Do you want to be suicided? Well, the thing yeah. is, I had friends at school, <laughs> well, uh, sorry, friends at the school gate, rather, who knew people who were in jail for saying the, doing the wrong thing. Accounts have been in jail for, like, you know, four years because they didn't have Krushka protection. You know, everyone's being protected by everybody else, all the way up to the top. <coughs> So whilst Abramovich, etc., you know, he's you know he's very well respected, or whatever you want to call it, person. Um, I was just the way I was, it was expressed to me is, Quinton, if you want to do anything out there, you get make sure you get paid into a bank account three times what you ever believe you could be paid into a bank account in Cyprus before you even turn up. That was the only way to do it. Yeah, sounds like he has the same problem in China, right? But what is that? Why, yeah, why can't that, that be revived now? Well, it could. The funny thing is, there was a subsidiary. There's, there was a subchapter to that one. Is that Lancaster University were doing some stuff? <coughs> excuse me, we're relating to soil remediation stuff because part of the exercise is instead of doing gasification, you could do what's called pyrolysis, which is doing the same thing as gasification, but in the absence of oxygen, which creates a soil beneficent called biochar, which has various properties, which is quite useful for, as a soil beneficent, amongst other things. And we thought, this is, I've spoken to some people at Lancaster University, and they had a very strong links with the China, uh, Chinese Academy of Science. And, of course, China's burning lots of coal, blah, 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 and everything else. And they thought this, and they were seeking to make a, this, this is the time, create a, a, not a, well, a circular economy, if you call it that in the broadest sense, but in a much more direct thing, they were actually trying to create a parallel <coughs> energy market or, or carbon market so that anybody who's burning carbon would have to pay a small tax and you had to buy your, you know, your forfeits or whatever it was. 
And that's why I thought that the use of the system, as I've described it to you, would be quite useful in the Chinese thing because they were still building lots of power stations. And I was thinking of the guys who I was talking to at Lancaster University. Well, Quinton, why don't you go out and work in China, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, that could be really helpful. And, and I thought about it. And I thought, well, my children are just at the stage of school. You know, I'm not going to, you know, chasing a dream out there because I'm so hung up on this idea, etc. And I decided not to do it. Um, so I, I relinquished, you know, that that aspect. I mean, that pattern's there. You know, I've, I've, it's in, under my name. Um, you know, you look it up in the just this year or whatever it's called, the IPO thing. There it is. Um, so that's my brain. It just works in slightly mm -hmm. odd, creative ways. That that's the other thing that makes me a little bit skeptical of how catastrophic climate change emergency in inverted commas yeah. is. And you mentioned China there with the coal plants. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. yeah. The, it, the, like the whole world of superpowers or yeah. or first world who have the ability to, you know, coordinate, fund, support, uh, leading minds, think as scientists into mm. researching this stuff. They mm. would all be in unison. They should all be in unison in thinking the same thing. We'd all come to the same conclusions. China are not. Yeah. And I don't think Russia are either. So why, like, China should have the same concern as us. If, if the data... And all of that points to yeah, yeah. we've we got a real problem here yeah, yeah. worldwide. Why aren't China following suit? Because like, we're, we're, li we're living in the world of rail politic. It's only the rest of the world has only just, you know, the old the world, you know, the, the liberal rules order world, as described by various politicians, only came to an end about three years ago, as Kissinger actually admitted in an interview um, with some, I can't remember the guy's name, in New York. But essentially, rail politic is reasserting itself. What politics? Rail politic, first developed back in by von Rochow in eighteen sixty-three. Rail. Rail politic. It's Rail politic. politic. I've never way, heard this before. Explain yeah, it to me. Well, it's the way th it was always used as a pejorative sense uh, when pointing out the militaristic tendencies of Germany and Bismarck during the uh, unification of Germany in eighteen seventy, <clears throat> and then um, and how it consequently his application of foreign policy towards the Balkans and Russia and Austro-Hungary, etc., in that, those latter period of the years up to about 1890. Um, it's got a number of different sort of interpretations of what real politic is, but in fact, the person are you real, R-E-A-L, okay, real and then politic without a C, but it's got a K instead, okay, yeah, real politic. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Anyhow, the guy who's written the best book on this one up to date is a guy called John Bew, who thankfully ex-King's College London, has been the foreign policy advisor and is now the direct advisor to James Cleverly. Name, was what, name is what? John Bew. John Bew, yeah. He is, he, is, he is the man who's now re-establishing our position as understanding what grand strategy is that we used to have pre... Uh, we've lost... The, there seems to be a, not an amnesia, but there's a loss of that institutional thinking that used to permeate the Foreign <coughs> Office in particular up until probably about 1960, late 60s. And then STEM became merged with different kind of conflation of different objectives beyond what the, what the so-called national interest could be described as. And John Pugh is the best person who's now advising our government on those matters. Real politic, come back to that. Yeah. So you were, you were explaining it. Oh, you want me to explain it? Yeah. David briefly, Stark. briefly. Because we, we need to get on to right. the, yeah, the, yeah, the, the, the app in a minute. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> getting a history lesson. Um, the rail politics is essentially the understanding of the other... Right, so you've got different, op sorry, different operators in the world, like we're talking about China, Germany, blah, 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 blah. It might be more helpful to understand to, to when you're looking at the way Russia is behaving right now in terms of the kind of big power rivalries that used to... the way it was described back in the 19th century of which the Congress of Vienna and Castle Ray, our minister or foreign minister, and Metternich in Austria used to basically run the show in Europe to make sure everyone sticked within a certain sort of bandwidth in the way they operated, etc. The rail politic appreciation of a state's behaviour is a combination of an analysis of a number of different issues, which starts off, obviously, it's geography, it's social makeup, it's economic makeup, it's uh, wealth. So, as, as, you know, and these, these are different levels. And so, when you're seeking to address 
the interaction of you, say you are country X and you're dealing with country Y, the ability to understand the way that other country actually behaves is best understood through an analysis of rail politic within those descriptors that I've just identified. I mean, there's a lot more to it than that. It's also, it's, <clears throat> aren't those also some of the ways that if we should really, we should really rank, in inverted commas, countries against each other in terms of power as opposed to just looking at GDP? Correct. Absolutely, because you might have a high GDP, but you've actually got a low threshold upon which you can actually defend certain things. Because one of the, the main aims of any, any government's position is actually to defend its own borders, without which it's actually just, it's not even sovereign. And that's maybe one of the arguments about the issues about the European Union right now. Is it a state actor itself, but it doesn't have any control of any, uh, marshal any forces, albeit it's now putting in place certain legislation to allow what might be seen to be a proto-force in terms of frontier guards in particular, and also under, one, I think, Section 123 of the Lisbon Agreement, uh, was it 122, um, that they can actually, in terms of a civil war, say if one of the member states, if they, the, the member state itself could actually call upon the European Union to intervene in a state of where there's insurrection going on in that state, which is an unusual position to have, because <coughs> at what point could that actually then change the balance of what's actually going where... Previously, countries would not necessarily interfere with, with within within the states other states' borders, and so we've got this sort of funny meta, different a, a different kind of actor who that has economic power but not a centralised political decision making process. I'm talking about the European Union right now, in order to say to enforce any particular positions regarding, say, Russia. It's got an opinion, but it can't enforce anything, can it? Uh, I I I disagree with that. Okay. Because, it, well, don't ask me to elaborate on it, but I would disagree with it because they, they, they don't, no, it's not a centralised way of, of uh, influence, of, of uh, deciding on policy for, uh, with the Russia thing. Yeah. But the amount of influence they have doesn't mean they, they can't. Influence is it, different. I'm saying making a sovereign decision. I, because oh, if you've okay. got a foreign policy, yeah. you say, my foreign policy is X, yeah. and then I can enforce it with force. That's what a sovereign state can do. Okay, yeah. So it's not quite a full sovereign state in that sense, albeit it's got a legal sovereignty, as we all have been fighting over in Brexit for, over in it, you know, for the last God knows how many years so far. Understood. Hmm. All right. Let's let's steer away from all the controversy. Right, I, this is the third this is the third podcast in a row. I've got oh no, it's the second one in a row. I thought <laughs> I did not expect to go down. <laughs> okay, so I'm not complaining. It's good. No, it's really no. interesting. It's yeah, good. It's good. It's good. Especially, it's, um, I didn't expect to be asked about this either. Actually, <laughs> <laughs> right. <clears throat> take a take a sip of your Guinness. Thank you. <laughs> And let's begin so let's come on to, uh, I want to chat to you about the reason I invited you over. Okay. The main reason. Right. Um, and uh, thank you to Dave Davis for the introduction, which is mega. So, Veronigma, right? And feel free to have a second, Sergio Guinness. While I, if I were you, I'm going to explain what Veronigma is by reading off the website. Okay. okay? So, and then we'll come on to it. Uh, so, Veronigma Daedalus? Daedalus? Yeah, Daedalus. Daedalus, yeah, yeah, Daedalus. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay, Veronigma Daedalus is a mobile app service which provides insight into your mental health. Your data is uploaded to our system minute by minute to help you understand the factors influencing your mental state throughout the day. Our users can use the information to understand their own emotional state and take steps to turn things around uh, before things start to deteriorate. Veronigma is designed to help users to self-manage their mental health far more effectively. Now, <clears throat> before I ask you about this, how this came about, Mr. Barrister, environmental scientist, chef, now Veronigma founder, right? <laughs> mm, yeah. What I like, when we were talking on the phone about this, what I liked about this is it, uh, t there was a, a certain thing that pricked my ears up with it when we were, t when we were talking, which first came on my radar in terms of a need for it, talking to Mandy Bostwick, who I mentioned to you, number 99, we were talking mm -hmm. about mental health. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the important things that is especially lacking in the military, or was at the time of that conversation, it's not lacking in certain areas, it still is in most at the moment, is baselining mental health. Mm -hmm. Baselining yeah. people's mental state yeah. with the reason that then you can detect fluctuations in the mental health. And, and I'll analogize this with the situation I got going on at the moment is... Uh, I need to have a blood test to check for I may be ill or maybe not in a mm. certain way. And I happen to have had a blood test last year. So I have got a baseline. I know where my blood's are in a good, mm. in a, at a good level. Before that, I don't think I've got anything. So in this next blood test, there is a, a baseline. I can, 
I won't, my GP will measure yeah. against measure me against my healthy me a year ago. Yeah. I may still be healthy now, I hopefully am. Yeah. But the check. One of the things this tool can be used for is baseline. I'm gonna stop now. Verenigma. Mm. Talk to me about Verenigma, please, Quinton. Do you want a hist- quick plot of history or do, it do you want one hundred percent. Okay. The reason why this even got to where we are right now, and I I didn't plan on doing this, um, was that back in two thousand eight, do you remember the Mid Staffordshire Hospital scandal? Uh, vaguely, but remind me. Basically, 1,500 people died in hospital you shouldn't have done. Over what time period? Uh, about a couple of years. Bad management, bad care, the whole shit show. And I read the public inquiry, the Francis report, and I analysed it both from my legal perspective and from my um, <coughs> science point of view. And I was, the, the thing that seemed to... The, 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 my reduction of that uh, big report was that basically... It was clear that no one had control over the information. The way the information was produced was actually the, the biggest flaw in the game, is that mo- all care is basically, I'm looking after you, I, I, the person looking after you, write my report and mark my own work. That's the problem. So as a consequence, in, those, that, as area, in that area of that hospital, nothing, got, nothing proper got written down or went all the way through to be managed. All just became information and then massaged along the way, for various reasons. So I thought, well, in order to be able to stop that, you needed to produce different kinds of evidence to be able to be... Well, I thought, what would I want to do if I was putting evidence into court? And from my perspective, the, I came up with five criteria, and it was as follows. One, that the evidence had to be produced independently. It can't be you know, me writing, I, I was really good today. It's saying something else was doing it. But it was real time, it was contemporaneous with the event that you're seeking to describe in evidence. That... It was measurable. It's not just yes or no, but it was, you know, anywhere between naught and 10 or something like that. So how severe or how good or whatever. Then the third one, it's reproducible evidence. It's reliable. And then the fourth one, or fifth one rather, is that it's usable in the environment that you're actually operating in. And then it took me about three years to work out that our voice is directly controlled by our perceptions. <coughs> you, can, you can disguise what you're saying, but you can't hide them. Or you can hide, but you can't disguise. The point is, is that your voice control is controlled by the anterior cingulate cortex, which in the brain you've got a number of different networks, which all interchange at the anterior cingulate cortex. That's default mode networks, like when you lie back like this. That's default mode network. When you bring to my attention, you go, that's my salience network kicking in, and those switches all occur in this little part of the brain of just the ACC. <coughs> But it's also where chronic pain arises. It's also where anxiety arises. The neuronal activation, literally the the neurons, is happening right there. And we can pick it up through the sound of the voice because that's where it, cause it's controlling the voice. So we then got a co- load of, I got a load of computer scientists to be able to separate out <coughs> your voice and my voice. Because I'm, I'm trying to get this model of care in a closed environment. So we need to be able to pick up your voice and my voice simultaneously so we can separate out what's going on. And then work out, say, if you're stressing me out, it will come out in my voice that, you know, my voice is getting more stressed. And you, therefore you can tell the difference between good, bad and ugly care because you obviously don't want the last two, you want the first one. And one way of being able to the litmus test for the suitability of the care would be how I'm interacting with you. So that if it's good care, there won't be any great deal of anxiety. There might be some background stuff, because obviously I'm an anxious person or whatever, but it's not increasing just as you turn up on the, as I turn up on the scene. And that way you can rank care. So if you've got five people looking after your mum coming in and out during the day, and she's a bit gaga, then, she could, then you can see whether if she's okay with one, you know, care is one, two, and three, but four and five, are, she's going, ah, like that. You might think, well, let's intervene. Let's see, you know, change, change the order, change, change things around. So that was the thinking behind it. Having achieved the sort of computational mathematics behind that, which wasn't as tricky as you might think, but it wasn't trivial either, um, we then started trying it out with people. And then one of my friends who's got bad chronic pain called Kippo, he, um, he gets shooting pains from an accident he had many years ago. I mean, it's a crippling stuff. And he said, Quinton is picking up on my chronic pain. I thought, what the hell is all that about? And it's through this that I then expanded. He said what? A, a, it's, the system is picking up on my chronic pain through his voice. Yes, so I couldn't even. I couldn't even. In what way? Because the, the system was picking up on uh, when he when he had higher levels of chronic pain, it was just registering on on the system. Even and he was we, just talking normally. 
Yeah, well, he was, well, he, well, he was going to see Quinton I'm noticing because he used it for about three or four months. He said, Quinton, well, this is what's happening. I thought, that's really interesting. And we were filtered. Basically, what the system did is, is that we, through a microphone on the mobile telephone, we can pick up your voice. We take a small snippet of your, your voice and we can analyse it for various different things. And how we, the system trains itself onto the features that we're interested in is that we get a whole load of voices who are anxious or a load of voices that are depressed, or a whole load of voices with minor cognitive impairment, or those with chronic pain. And we filter them, essentially, and then we apply our system to be able to pick up these very small signal processing signals, which are identified with those particular neuropsychiatric disorders. So, to, sorry, so to understand, so you, to, in order to identify what the markers are, in the, like in the audio yeah. from the voice, yeah. so you will get people who you know, for Maybe example, are, depress are depressed. Bingo. Hundred, a yep. thousand, sample them yep, and yep, go. Yep. Okay, That's this it. is the commonality in those in their voices across the board. This is the marker for depression that yep. we should be looking for. That's it. Can you? Okay, go on. So what? So what? So what can you identify then? We could do anxiety, depression, chronic pain, minor cognitive impairment, which is you know that on the slow road to dementia. Um, emotional exhaustion, which is a subdivision of elixithymia. Elixithymia nobody knows about, but it's a thing where quite often what happens is elixithymia is inability to read your own emotions, which is quite often afflicts autistic people, for instance. And the people who've got traumatic brain injuries, acquired, you get acquired elixithymia, whereby you are <coughs> unable to just... What's that word? Elixithymia, A-L-X, which is blindness to your own emotions. Okay. Now, it's analysed using a 20 questionnaire thing, it's a self-report exercise, but we actually did that filtration approach using one of the subdomains of what this elixithymia is comprised of, which is an inability to differentiate your own emotions, or to identify your own emotions, or to differentiate, or to take, gain a perspective. These are, and these are done through questions. We took the first aspect, which was the inability to distinguish one's own emotions in the first case, and therefore <coughs> took those people, which is... The main, the main part of the game, to see how to the extent to which they are emotionally exhausted. There's other sets of questions you could ask. Because emotional exhaustion is often comorbid with chronic pain. You're just, ter you're just like flaked out the whole time by this, the, the, the constant subjective bombardment of the, your own sense of pain and distress of it. The use of the word emotional exhaustion isn't used in the lexicon of medical dictionaries at the moment because it is to some extent, but it's very much on the periphery. It's not used when people say, well, what's your chronic pain level? They say, well, it's about eight or whatever, you know, and they say, and they give you various, and you get given drugs for that within that context. What we found is that we asked a whole lot of people um, who've got chronic pain. These were, these were veterans as well. These were US veterans and we did some UK ones as well whether the word emotional exhaustion was a very was a useful expression as a part of their experience of chronic pain, as opposed to saying, I've got chronic pain. And over 90% of them said, yes, it was either useful or very useful. What's the significance of that? It means that we've possibly got a new indicator which can be quite useful in this respect. What we found out is that emotional exhaustion, in terms of the system that we can use to measure changes in the neurophysiological neuronal activation that's going on in the anterior cingulate cortex <coughs> is that those with emotional exhaustion have a neuronal deactivation i.e. bugger all going on a healthy person's neurophysiological profile will have lots of activity and lots of variability and that's all you know it's nice it's all nice in the garden so to speak but when you get significant severe conditions of either say, say uh, depression or anxiety or, or combination thereof, because quite often these things actually present themselves not on their own, but together. And this is particularly true of veterans. Something like in the American experience, there's a much higher incidence of those presenting with all three, you know, like, like getting a bloody royal flush of problems, not just one. Um, so consequently, the ability to measure these simultaneously and see what's driving what is actually one of the aspects that we're looking to be able to achieve in this clinical trials we're taking, that we're undertaking very shortly. Sorry, so so the three being um, depression, anxiety, and chronic pain. Depression, anxiety, and chronic pain. Okay, all right, yeah. For the minor cognitive impairment. Yes. How how did you discover the marker for that? Same process, filtrating people who've already been labelled with minor cognitive impairment. 
How accurate was how accurate was their diagnosis? It's not, not that great. That's the problem. <laughs> <laughs> but on the <laughs> other hand, because, because it's either a yes or a no, the problem with minor cognitive impairments is it fluctuates. It comes and goes. What happens to the general prevalence of it? You know, when you get older, you, know, you get a bit forgetful and all the rest of it. That can be just general aging. When it moves into minor cognitive impairments, where there's a stronger element of a persistent features. What happens, you can move into cognitive impairment in your mid-60s or whatever, and you can stay in, in that level of impairment. Or you can go, it carries on down into dementia. You know, after a period of time, a good cohort do move into dementia. We're talking things like uh, short-term memory is very poor, or Executive the ability function. to add up simple exactly. figures. Exactly, three different ways it's looked Nothing at. that's majorly impacting you, but you're a bit of a moron in certain areas now. Where exactly, you and, then, and then yeah. sometimes your minor cognitive impairment can get better again. So that's what makes it so difficult to actually bloody detect it in the first case because it's sometimes there and sometimes not and of course excuse me if you change the framework of thinking of how you're analyzing this thing so you, instead of looking at one single data point which is normally how am i feeling today doctor well not that great or whatever it is you've got multiple data points that you can see intradaily interdaily interweekly and so on and so forth you get a quite a different picture and therefore you can see what you should be doing within a particular range of things whether or not to intervene at what threshold and so forth so we can get much more significant information, which is much more useful than what we've presently got, which is normally a mini cog test, or I can't remember what the tests are called now, but essentially it's a question of what it, you know, could you do this? Can you count a clock backwards and this kind of stuff, which gives a bit of stress on the brain and, and those who, and, and the, those things are reasonably accurate up to about 70%. You know, 70, 75% is the usual level of reproducible results. With our system, we've already got an accuracy levels somewhere in, the, in those features, just around there or just above that. And that's just on very limited amounts of it, data that we've actually acquired so far. We, we trained and, test, and tested the system on, I think, about 116 people who had minor cognitive impairment, and we achieved those levels of accuracy. We're going to get some more voices shortly where we'll be able to achieve, because the system is produced, goes in such a way, the more data you throw at it, the more it self-tunes. So we're looking prospectively to have a, a screener for minor cognitive impairment. And this has two particular applications, <coughs> given where we are today, and a rugby club with his juniors playing outside, is that, and we know that it's been in the papers recently about the number of these uh, famous rugby players now getting early dementia, you know, going that down long road into darkness, is that people want to be able to know when to stop. We could have produced a screener so you can have on your phone. So when you get a series of concussion, things like that, and you start developing a certain marginal amount of minor cognitive impairment, that's your time to stop, isn't it? Because what generally happens with minor cognitive impairment, it goes so far down the line, by the time it's detected, it's already too late. And then you just got to make your will and all the rest of it. And then well, the other part, apart from the sports side of things, which is contact sports like American football <coughs> and the English version as well, is that... Um, in the military situation, those who've had combat exposure, either through direct or indirect traumatic brain injury, have the issue that you know, basically their brain's been shaken up, and sometimes it doesn't go back to normal. We know we have the various other descriptors of PTSD, plus you know, those who've got traumatic brain injury, quite often higher incidence of PTSD, and so on and so forth, is that... Um, 12%, this is an adventitious study done by the Veterans Administration in 2018. They did about 500 soldiers, median age about 48 to 50, you know, middle-aged guys who've been in for 20 years, 10 years or whatever it was. A full 12% of those tested had minor cognitive impairment. That is huge. You normally only find that cohort by the time you get to 70 what, eight, what was the age, average age of this group? About 48 to 50. Yeah. Oh, the medium is about 52 or something like that. So these guys are already have been, they've got the damage. Now, what do you do about it? But you don't know which ones they are. Then no one's going to spend a load of money trying to find out which is it, you or you or you. But with this system, we could actually provide a means of going back to your original point, baseline. You want baseline before and, and, and then take it on from there. Because there's no reason, because this stuff is cheap. The brilliant thing is everyone's got a bloody telephone. Mm. And consequently, you can intervene early because there's certain things you can do with minor cognitive impairment which have certain, you know, it's a benefit of beneficial effects. But you might be able to change the trajectory. I'm not saying you will, but you, it's, it, it's, put it this way, unless you know about it, you ain't going to be able to do anything about it. As simple as that. 
Consequently, the urgency of this is, is already well recognised both by, both by the British government and by the US government. The NIH, which is the research facility that shoves lots of money at you know, things to do get results, and the NIHR in the UK both asked last year for a, a screener for minor cognitive impairment. And it was at that point I asked my, I told my computer bods, uh, Sam and A. Kachaki, and so I said, we've got it, we've done it. And we fulfilled the criteria for an NIHR submission. They would give us some money, and I was quite happy reasonably with the uh, contractual aspects. Um, but that fell to pieces in January this year for one reason or another. Uh, Sai decided to pull out, but that was his prerogative, so anyhow. But that's at that point I realized that the whole process of validating for commercial use certification of these systems in the UK is actually fairly complex and very expensive. This commercialization process I was going to do is going to cost 1.8 million. I thought, and also there was a very odd thing that was said to me, in, it was an off-cuff remark by one of the academics at a subsequent meeting I had with some other academics saying, and it seemed to me there was very much a closed shop. Those who've already got the money get more money. If you haven't had any money, you don't get any money. And that, that was fine. That's pretty much normal common and garden stuff in its own way. But from my perspective, I thought I want to go off to America and get it done there because it's much more transparent. You get, you can do go down a particular route. If you've got a new application and it needs a new classification, they will do it in a certain time frame, blah, 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 at a certain cost or recognizable limits to it, should we say. And that's why I started pursuing this route into America to get it certified there first of all. And it was through meeting somebody who was my Sherpa to take me through that quite difficult bureaucratic set of administrative decision making that we then discussed, well, we need a partner in the United States. And he suggested the Veterans Administration. And it was through that, I said, that's a good shout. And it's through that that I then came across all this extra stuff and its application within the veteran or military context, which I had really not precluded, but had really seen that as a side issue to looking after the elderly, which is my original proposition. Such that with that, but then with the closer I got to the Veterans Administration, because they were actually offering tons of money for people to come up with new ideas about being able to control people who got suicidal ideation, which, of course, is one of the running themes of guys who leave the military and in the military itself. Interesting thing I read of that recently was that, um, oh, I can't remember where I read it, but that uh, suicidal ideation yeah. is actually pretty common amongst most people. It's, it's, it's not as uncommon as you'd like to think. Yeah, pretty common kind of most, yeah. most people in terms of they th they think about it, but to no depth. To yeah, no, yeah, yeah. To, to no yeah, depth. Exactly. Yeah. Um, which, which surprised me. But, sorry, sorry. So, I interrupted there. No, I have got a couple of questions for you. Go, but, go for it. Uh, do it now. All right, so, you know that at the moment the, the do, you want to, do you want to call it the app? Yeah. Do you call it the app? Is that yeah. what you call it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, you know at the moment that Verenigma, the app, can detect... Anxiety. Go on. What was it? Chronic pain, depression. The usual anxiety, the, chronic it's pain, a matrix depression. of things that just generally present together. Yeah. Okay. And emotional exhaustion as well. And emotional exhaustion as well. Yeah. All right. So, two questions: How accurate is it at predicting those, and uh, how much, how many instances of misdiagnosis are there? What you use is there's, in medical terms, you use the word sensitivity and specificity. And those two words, I always get confused which way around they are. Okay. Basically, it's the degree to which you're creating false positives and false negatives. Either, you know, when you say there's something, there's not actually something there, and when they should, you know, and so on. So at that level, we hit about 75% across the piece in both aspects, of both sensitivity and specificity. Because quite often, you'll get a situation, you can accurately predict that, there is, that you're getting it right when it's there, but you're not getting it right when it's not there. Are you not saying it's it's not correctly saying it's not there when it's not there? So you can say it's seventy five percent accurate. Both sides, yeah, both sides of that game. Now that's quite, which is which is quite, that's what we've got at the moment, which I think is pretty pretty okay because when you look at when you go to see a doctor, they, they know better than fifty percent in getting it right, with analysing whether you got depression or not, because there's a lot more until there's the level two, level three care, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So anyhow, I'm not in a not this, I'm not you know professional help etc at all far from it but when i what the consideration is on a suicidal ideation thing is when i started investigating this thinking well we might be able to help with that because we know that these are very much precursors of you know people who've got chronic pain are double double doubly likely to have suicidal ideation if you're exhausted fatigue is directly related to having suicidal ideation and suicide attempts so if you can reduce the amount of chronic pain 
the antecedents to that, you might be able to disentangle some of the suicidal ideation, is my theory. Now, yep. on that basis, we are now at the stage of with the, the clinical trials we're doing, this is for certification in the US, is twofold. One is we've got to say what, we, what the thing does on the lid, which is, are we accurate in, what, in, the, in the assertion of the statistics that I've just given to you? Secondly, on the suicidal ideation side, what we're doing, we're getting, um, we've got about 45 veterans at the moment. Not all of them have got suicidal ideation. So on the basic certification system, does it do what it says, which is do the chronic pain? Can it manage it? Can we derive causal relationships? Is it the chronic pain which is driving the depression or is it depression driving the causes the, the chronic pain and the anxiety? We can do that with some rather clever, clever maths, even though we don't know the causal structure at present. There's some maths that we can do on the data to be able to appreciatively, appreciatively give direction on a causal basis to that. Is that based on whichever signal is strongest? Essentially, yes. Or the relationship, yeah, how often they interrelate at what particular point, we can actually derive that, yes. That's what we're saying. What about, how does medication um, play into it? it? That remains to be seen, but it strikes me that a lot of medic, the masking of pain, for instance, is one, you know, like when you have a headache, you take some aspirin or whatever it might be, or something stronger. Those mask the pain. They, you know, there's the neuroceptors, which, you know, they, you know, stops the transmission of certain neuronal activation. Um, without, and I'm treading on sort of way outside my, my competence levels, and the first thing to say on that one, is that nonetheless, if you might be suffering, there's probably people suffer from chronic pain, even when they're not suffering from it, they're suffering from it because there's side issues to the exercise of it which change their whole behaviour. They get fearful of doing things where they, because they anticipate chronic pain coming back. And therefore, they'll change their... And that creates a sense of oppression and anxiety. So if you're a doctor, you think, Christ, I've got to deal with this anxiety as well as depression, as well as a chronic pain. Which one do I do first? If the person who's trying to manage their own pain says, well, actually, I know that the, most, the biggest driver of my, of my chronic pain is the elixithymia caused by the emotional exhaustion because that is actually... That drives the intensity of the suffering I'm actually perceiving, actually feeling. Therefore, if I can reduce the elixithymia or the emotional exhaustion then I'm halfway to reducing the amount of chronic pain I'm suffering. This friend of mine, Kippo, who was taking drugs, I mean, he has bags of the stuff to keep his body in check, so to speak. Kippo. He sounds like a rugby player with that nickname. Is he a rugby player? Well, not any longer. <laughs> Kippo. <laughs> I think he got it because he was actually fell asleep I'm, the So the I'm, I'm picturing a six foot three, second row uh, English schoolboy. Am I right? Well, it's not quite that. You know, he actually he used to be a cox at, in, in the rowing things. So I should have said that. He's a, yeah. a lot smaller, but he's got a lot I bigger. I just described my dad as well. I haven't just realised. just described my dad. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, go on. <laughs> uh, anyhow, so he, he said that when he started using the system, because he's got lots of painkillers and things like that, and some of them are real mind numbers, he said that he could reduce the amount of pain pills he had to take because of using the system. He could Because he, he was more in control. Explain how... Go, go on. He uh, found it's one of those strange things that we found about the system. We, we, so this is my friend Kip. I've known him for thirty years, and he was using it because he's a bit geeky and all the rest of it. And he said, "I'll have a go with this, Quint." And and one of the things he said, "Quint, I managed to reduce my n my number of pills I have to take for pain, which are at the highest level, you know, opioid type stuff, etc., by a third or something, or some you know something like that." And I thought, "Oh, that's great. You know, well done." I'm not thinking a huge amount about it, except I'm just glad it's working for you. But then when I looked into it further about um, when we did the analysis that we found when people using the system, it reduced the severity of their anxiety and depression quite significantly, albeit at a lower level. We thought, well, why is that happening? Because we haven't done anything. You're just using so the, the system. So, so they, they're using it just to see, oh, where am I at? What is affecting That's me? That's it. They're not going, oh, to the doctor and say, here's a the drama. They're just using the system. They're, just to check in. Yeah. So they're more aware of what's Best going situation. on. Okay. That's well, about it. You think, okay, that's nice to know, you know. Yeah. But what was actually happening was actually reducing the symptoms. And I thought, well, what the hell's that coming from? Anyhow, this is where, this is when, this, this, the, I then spent, I spent a year just trying to understand all these things, which I can now talk about to you. Because one thing I can do as an ex-lawyer and things like this, I can chunk huge amounts of information. I've read more on this subject than probably anybody, I, full stop. Because I've had to go beyond the disciplines that, everybody else tends to stick within it, sorry, in the silo, etc. Anyhow, there's a guy called Gross, Professor Gro Gross at Stanford, who's done a lot of work in looking at the way people perceive that, you know, when, you, when you're sitting quiet, you can say, well, I'm not in pain, I can feel my body, I know where I'm at, I'm in this room, blah, blah, blah. 
and your sense of interior awareness is what he's tend to focus in on. What we do as a part of emotional regulation, this comes back to the larger point about PTSD, people with PTSD and things like that, is the inability to regulate your own emotions. You go like that. And then what he found is that people sometimes adopt strategies to try to control their situation better. Sometimes it's successful, sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's a maladjustment in such a way that the very things they think they're doing to help them actually make it even worse. That can also happen. And one of the things they do is that part of the exercise in their theoretical thing is, is that you actually have this thing called um, effect labeling. I, I'm feeling a bit tense or like this. What is it? What am I feeling? Am I, I'm, I'm scared? Yeah, okay, I'm scared. What am I going to do about this to stop feeling scared? And it's that little conscious added you know, approach which helps is beginnings of your processing of your emotions at a conscious level. And that's an explicit emotional regulation. But there's also what's called implicit emotional regulation, which is just carrying on with your normal day. But the way you choose to do things actually has a good effect upon your general sense of well-being. You know, well, there's nothing particularly new in that, potentially. But there's also the, 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 the thing is, is that when people say, oh, how, am I, how am I feeling at the moment? I'm feeling well, I'm feeling okay. I'm feeling a bit distressed. I'm a bit sad about that. People who've got acquired alexithymia you can be born with it as well and autistic a lot of autistic people have this inability to read their own emotions they just feel i'm 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 anxious that's about it that's all you can work out they're much narrow bandwidth but you can also get that acquired through traumatic brain injury as well which we've mentioned earlier now the, one of the things that interacting with the system does is it creates what's called implicit emotion uh, implicit effect labeling I'm not saying to myself, I'm feeling anxious, but I've just said, I, I, I clock in on the thing, I see those little bar charts and I've got my anxieties there, my depression's there or chronic pain's there. I am visually looking at that and I'm clocking what my own interior awareness is. But the very effect processing that takes place, that interaction has an effect of actually increasing the effective process that takes place in the situation between the anterior, the insula, the prefrontal cortex and the anterior cingulate cortex at the same time so it has just this little process reduce has an effect of reducing some well increases the connectivity between those things which are functionally quite often disconnected to a greater degree with people suffering from those conditions and therefore you're reintroducing a better situation through that process you're this effect labeling i oh that's why I'm, I'm less i'm less distressed than i was yesterday kind of thing helps you to you know gear yourself in better you know, cue yourself in, mm -hmm. tune yourself in, should we say? And I think that's what it does, and I think that's what we've got. So it's, but it, but it, that's what we're trying to do now with these guys who we're doing the clinical trials with to see how effective, to what extent that is really, it really works. Secondly, we've asked them, what would you consider to be the minimal improvement you would accept in your situation for chronic pain? So you've got some people who have chronic pain level two, and some people have chronic pain level eight. Now, of course, 10% of eight is a hell of a lot more than 10% of two. But we found that everybody right across that, the, the, the whatever levels, they thought a 30% increase in improvement would be considered to be the minimal improvement that they were considered to be meaningful for them. So I thought, okay, that's quite a high bar. So we're going to find 30%, that. 30%. 30%. Yeah. Or, yeah. So I thought, okay, let's, let's see if we can do that. So that's what we're trying to do. See if that does have that thing which we say that increase in emotional regulation has, res has resulted in effects of reduction of chronic pain or of anxiety or of depression. Moving slightly sideways to the suicidal ideation thing, because this is another key element which we were seeking to address originally by going to America, because the Veterans Administration wanted to find some answers to the suicidal ideation problem, any problem, because as we know, more, more, more guys are and girls are committing suicide back at home than have died on the battlefields of the past 25 years. You know, it's 6,000 a year are killing themselves, so you add up the figures for Afghanistan, Iraq, one, two, three, or whatever, you'll see there's a whole lot less. And, and the degree of people who are killing themselves are, are, right, are right across the age groups, from Vietnam veterans all the way up to the, the youngsters who are just coming out now. Now, the suicide ideation thing we're doing is this, is that because we can measure neuronal changes within the day, not just, you know, you come in on a Thursday and you come in next Thursday, etc. One, there's a guy who's a very big specialist on suicidal stuff called Kleiman, Professor Kleiman at Rutgers University. And he's done this thing called measuring people's changes in their fluctuations of their mental state prior to suicidal attempts. 
or suicidal ideation. And what happens, what I've seen from the stuff that he's got, is that when people have this suicidal episode, it isn't like, you know, it gets, duh, 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 boom, oh, that's it, I'm out of here, kind of thing. What happens, what seems to happen, I've seen, is that uh, this, I'm seeing the episode, I'll give it over to you, so you may want to give us a link, something like that, is that people actually suddenly feel better, they feel better, and then they crash. So it's that crash, which is the, <coughs> I can't cope any longer bit, that meow. So if we can pick up those neurophysiological changes which correspond to that thing and model it. So what we've got is on the app, we've got, we've got people who are going to be using the system. Some are going to be able to be interacting and getting feedback. So we know we've got the control lot who are not, no feedback. So we can see the difference between the two. And then on the suicidal ideation, when someone who we know has got, sui got suicidal thoughts, tendencies or whatever, they have a little button. And they press that when they have a suicidal episode. And in fact, we do it on a slider. Because sometimes you can have little passive sort of things where I just don't really want to be here any longer to I'm, I'm going to go now kind of thing. So you've got an intensity level we can do as well. But we, by having pressed the start button on that, we then can pick up their, through their voice, the previous 24 hours. And therefore we can model the changes that have occurred both in chronic pain levels, emotional exhaustion, depression, anxiety, and ah. see... Because if we can model 50 or 60 of these different events simultaneously, you know, which we will do, because we'll pick up these different things, we'll be able to then make a prediction out of it, out of our model, out of our algorithms, and then test it against an another load and see how accurate we are. So you could, for, you could, for example, have a scenario in the future where this is rolled out and you've got a... You've got a... a a person who is using your app yeah. and uh, and let's say hypothetically that the the someone else a another a caregiver or a or a, a, a health person yeah, is, is monitoring it yep. and that help that that medical person could get a notification or alert to say hey um joe blogs uh is indicating a joe blogs <laughs> in the next seven days or no, 40 no, we're hours we're talking about within hours okay you know, no, 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 but That's i mean not that we're not looking weeks back because the changes, what happens is you could be normal here and within three hours, because a lot of people who commit suicide, and this is on the veterans in particular I'm thinking about, there was a study done by the VA, that they're okay and all of a sudden, within two hours, they've just blown their heads off out of nowhere. And that's what seems to happen. So it's that early hours, in those hours, just hours beforehand, which are absolutely crucial to know about. Not the predisposition of the person, oh, he's had some bad news last week, or, you know, it's just got gradually, gradually worse. It's these intradaily changes, which are so crucial. And there's a guy called Craig Bryan at Ohio University, who's a veteran counsellor, ex-military guy, who's described this in quite similar terms of these massive changes within the day. So using Kleiman's evidence, plus Craig Bryan's, what we're seeking to do is actually provide the baseline for a early warning system. Sorry, so changes through the day. Are you saying that this that the, the app yeah. would be monitoring your voice constantly? Well, whenever you're speaking, we can sample it through the day. Yeah. Ah. Or you, but during the, the, the what we're doing for the clinical trials, we're just going to take five data points through the day. So we just yeah. got it. You know, because someone might be a hermit, doesn't yeah. speak to anybody. That's not going to be much. But use, it, is it? I mean, as an operational app thing that is doing what you want it to do yeah. in the future, yeah, it, it would constantly be listening to you if you wanted it to or you could just set it for whatever levels mm. you want to because i think some people wouldn't be comfortable with that for whatever reason not necessarily processing anybody else's stuff we also have an issue on gdpr which is maybe something that raised people's attention is that in america you've got set different set of rules on this so and apple is it apple yeah yeah apple telephones don't like passive acquisition of data because it's they just don't yeah they like to control their own space <laughs> android don't care but essentially, what we think we, we can achieve with our system is that you could actually then embed it, if you wanted to, on, um, like, Amazon, you know, um, you know, on their Echoes. Echo, What's yeah. It? Alexa. Yeah, Amazon Echo, yeah. Alexa, yeah. So when you're looking out, it's just, you know, it's just sitting in the background. Just and those stuff. fuckers are always listening as well. And they are fucking listening, absolutely. So, sorry, so I'm trying to picture in my mind. So you, so probably the most the pe way people, most people want to use it, if, they, if they're using it, is... It would be a, like you say those day, those those prompts throughout the day. So, hey Joe, uh, say w they would have to say something to the app. You just need, we just need two seconds of speech to, to get a any snippet. speech. That's it. Yeah, it's a grunt. This is the other thing is it doesn't depend upon language. You can be you could be non-verbal. You know, like some people are. You know, you go uh, and that would actually we'll be able to pick up the call no. that. Yes, really? Yeah, that's what it's all about. 
because it's just literally we're, what we've got. You know when you people have those EEG things all, all on their on their skull those yeah. electrodes. Yeah. Basically, we're picking up these very same things, but through the sound of the voice. That is amazing. It's electrical. How come this this hasn't been tapped into before? Or has it? Because you only got someone as mad as me to think there's a question way outside left field, which was looking for better measured care elsewhere, and then finding these steps along with. That's why I've just taken such a long but time. But there's to... been voice analysis done for other things, hasn't that's there? Neuro, that's neuro, that's linguistic pro. Yeah, you know, that's that's language analysis, semantic analysis. That's not the same thing. This is a first in, the, in this application. It right? is, and that's why when we go to the states to get it certified by the Fed, we're, well, not Fed, sorry, FDA rather, Federal Drugs Agency, not the. Fed. <laughs> Um, <laughs> the Fed, they're going to arrest me, um, is that they haven't got a classification for this. So we've got to have a chat with them oh. to say, look, this is the evidence we've got. This is we think is robust, blah, blah, blah. We think he can do this both as a monitoring exercise, but also has these other, these other characteristics as well. Are you with us on this one? And they say, no, please demonstrate it. So we've got to demonstrate it to the full statistical thing. So I've got a group of people who are going to, work on this to make sure that we provide robust evidence with respect to that but once we've created a new this is what's called a de novo application to the fdn it's quite a it's not actually that long it probably takes about six to eight months which isn't bad compared to the british system which is years unless you've got billions and they can make a good, well no good it makes record. no difference it makes no difference the, the speed that fda has a certain process which oh. you stick to adhere to here in the uk it's not like that that's the problem in fact the British government is bringing in a white paper which is going to come through where they're going to create a system which mimics the American system for certification of software as medical device, amongst other things. Because they realise it's a, it's a load of crap what they've got at the moment. Interesting. Then following through, just on the point about the early warning system, it's quite an, two things. These are the veterans I've spoken to. Well, we've done analysis. We've, we've done questionnaires to UK and US veterans separately. We're talking about ones who self-manage in particular is that the use of the information themselves, the ones who self-manage, they think, that's that you or me. That's you. That sounds, like a, that sounds like a barrister's ringtone. Sorry, I'm just going to... No, sorry, eat your ticket. No, I'll turn it off. Um, <laughs> tell you what. Sorry, was that the Fed? That's, that's, that's my son. <laughs> was it? Saying, was Quentin, it? <laughs> Dad, where are you? I'm still, still talking as usual. Well, we'll, we'll yeah, start wrapping up. But, yeah, but, but the early warning system thing is that... Sorry, sorry. The, the information that's provided, the useful for self-managing, is that these people who previously want to self-manage consider it to have a significant clinical benefit that they would them, then themselves think it useful to be able to speak to professionals, which they previously, hitherto, were not prepared to do. So that's a really important key behavioural change, potentially. Say that again. Right, OK. These guys, they self-manage. I was still thinking about you, son. OK. They self-manage... You know, they hunker down, you know, stoic values and all the rest of it. And the previous doctors have not helped. So you just try and get on the best you can. With this system, we asked them the question directly. With using Veronigma, would you think, what would you, would you like to share this with your partner? No, not particularly. Thank you very much. I've quite, got quite enough my plate as I have, actually, rather than going to further discussions or about what's going on in your head. Oh, so given the results, for example, or the indication as to the partner. But yeah. then, but on the other hand, if, would you want to share it with a, prof with a professional? These are people who didn't want to share it at all with anybody. The answer is uh. seven-eighths of those self-managing said they would. Why? So I haven't got to the bottom of that. Because, and this, here's my thinking on it. Is that beforehand, you're told by the doctors, you've got PTSD, you've got anxiety, you've got depression, you've got chronic pain, and you're on the receiving end of that, okay? And therefore, you might accept some of the stuff, you might not accept all of it, you might accept some. But if you've got a, had a bad set of circumstances, you haven't got good treatment for one reason or another you're not going to go back and put yourself in through that again are you, you just, that's why you manage yourself but with this you own this information it's your information and that's why you've, you've got a, a re-empowering or an empowering because mm. you've got a parity of arms mm. and that's why you can go and say to them and say doctor look this is what this is this is what's actually happening what are you going to do about it and we've also got the causal things as well they say okay all of a sudden the doctor, instead of being on a higher plane than you, is actually now supporting you in this with this information decision making. Going back to the blood test mention, it would be like it's like in, in the same way as if I had the ability and the knowledge to be able to blood test or the system oh, to no, blood no. test myself yeah. and go, oh my god, and there then it'd be the same walking yeah, to the exactly. doc and go, hey doc, check this out, yeah. let's, let's square it away, yeah. please. I'm yeah. deficient in flipping whatever. <laughs> exactly. Interesting. Exactly. Conscious that you are neglecting your child. Somewhat. Um, <laughs> um, what uh, I was joking no, no. <laughs> he's okay he's just, he's, just, he's just wandering where I, he knows where I am 
What, it's um, on the reverse position now. That's a ton of these things, aren't they? <laughs> so you've got a clinical trials going on now. They will be starting in about three weeks' time. We will probably need some more people. So one of the things, my call to action of people, is anybody who's interested in this one, wants to communicate with us and say, hey, we want to find out more or take part, I'd be only too happy to respond to them. How do they get in touch? Uh, my email, it's Veronigma, is the website. I thought you were going to give your email. Don't give oh, your email. No, can't I'll, do that. I could, no, you can give it if you want. I don't care. I mean, no one's going to okay. help anybody out there. <laughs> <laughs> is the, the website successful? Yeah, but it's mine. It? It's Quinton, Quinton Richards at veronigma.com. Yeah, okay, cool. And the website's live, veronigma.com. I'll, yeah. I'll put the link to the website that's in cool. the blurb of this. Yeah, that's great. Um, are you so on... I like to talk to people, as you know. <laughs> I can tell. Are you on social media? I should be. I'm really bad at that. I've, I've been told I'm meant to be on it. I, I've no, no, of... don't be told that whatsoever. Yeah. Very Enigma should be on there. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it is. Yeah. If it you is. can avoid it, then avoid... No, if you're not on there, mate, avoid I it. I think I'm there with my children hanging around in the swimming pool on, on my shoulders. You know, they have the photo. Oh, on I think LinkedIn. you connected with me. Did you grab me on Facebook? Did, oh, no, LinkedIn. You grabbed me. Did you I? Did you grab me on LinkedIn? And I thought, you've well, got a family photo on there. Yeah, that's, that's, that's it. Yeah. Age yeah. old. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, look, I look about 50 now. I'm, I'm somewhat old, as you can tell. <laughs> Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but okay, email address veronigma.com is the main place. The website's really informative. I, you know, I read it to you at the start and you sent it to me before the podcast. Really interesting. Thank you. And We've changed it in a somewhat slightly different way because we're actually dedicating it to the military purposes, I mean, like veteran purposes, rather than broader based. But because we thought that it's the guys who are trying to look after themselves who are having the most trouble. And given that, in, particularly in America, 40% of people got the problems manage themselves they don't they think that va is a shit show whether right or wrong doesn't matter it's a bit like the nhs some people think it's really good some people think it's really bad in the uk the percentages are even higher the guys excuse me and the girls that we got from the uk constituency i think something like 60 percent were, were self-managing of x mill yep if they got if they've got problems that they were managing themselves because, you know, that's what you do, isn't it? You might speak to friends as well, you know, if you're com you know, in the confidence. It shouldn't be what they do, though. It shouldn't be what you do. But indeed, but you might have had pre there's, there's previous, obviously, there that well, has caused the situation. I mean, Self-managing, if you understand. Uh, no, well, some, some can do it because they can manage. Yeah, and yeah, some exactly. Because they can't, and it's actually making it worse. Yeah, so exactly, like, yeah, exactly. Yes, that's the point I was trying to get to. Thank you for... <laughs> thank you. Yeah. yeah, exactly, exactly. Okay, we need to wrap it up. Yep. Verenigma.com. Yep. V-E-R-E-N-I-G-M-A. Yep. Quentin Richards. It's yes. been enjoyable. They're really enjoyable. Yeah, well, really enjoyable. I tell you what, I didn't realise it was going to be quite as discursive as it was, <laughs> and you put me on the spot, and it's like, you know, I hope my game <laughs> got to a sufficient pitch. I oh, didn't claim too much. You're welcome back up any time, and um, good luck with Vernon. It sounds super promising, really interesting. I would like to be able to bring back results to you as they arise and say, hey, if, if, you know, obviously there's something really, you know, crucially sort of uh, lifts the game. Yeah, 100%. And also, any future uh, results on uh, climate change? I'll leave that to the Scotland. specialists. Special Scotland. <laughs> I'll, I'll bring you, I'll bring you, I'll bring, you I'll bring you full reports on that. <laughs> right. Cheers, buddy. Thanks a lot. That's it. Thank you for watching the H Hour podcast. If you're enjoying the podcast and you haven't already done so, please subscribe here around about there. I'm hoping it's around about there where the button's going to appear. If not, if it's not already appeared, uh, you can also, um, if, you want to listen to the podcast on your commute, for example, when you're driving, when it's not practical to watch the podcast, you can listen to it. It's on Spotify, it's on Apple Podcasts, it's on Google Podcasts, it's everywhere. It's on all of the uh, all of the common and not so common podcast apps. You can also, if you wish to do it, become a patron of H Hour. Becoming a patron of H Hour, you get access to all of the interviews before anyone else. So this interview with this guest was released days, if not weeks, before. It was on release to the general public. And you also get access to uh, exclusive interviews, which I do with each guest, that last about five, ten minutes, that are based on questions that the patrons themselves of H Hour have chosen. And each guest, this one included, gets asked those questions before the main podcast that's getting recorded. It's like a pre-podcast interview, lasts about ten minutes. And those interviews are really insightful, really enjoyable, nice and short, and they only release to patrons. They never get released to the public. I don't know why I had a little stutter there. Um, you also get access to a Discord community, exclusive Discord community only for patrons. You also get invited to a monthly Zoom call with myself and all the other patrons. And very often, most months, we have a previous podcast guest comes onto that Zoom call and has an exclusive Q&A with the patrons. 
In addition to this, there's monthly giveaways. We give away, give away gifts to my Patreon supporters. And it's all like, well, predominantly veteran-owned stuff. I'll go and buy veteran-owned apparel, veteran-owned product services, and I'll give them away to my Patreon supporters. And I'll also uh, do exclusive invites for events. So you'll get freebie tickets to events. To become a patron of Page Hour, go to patreon.com forward slash HK podcast. I'm spelling Patreon, P A T R E O N. Patreon.com forward slash HK podcasts. Hit become a patron. And uh, I'll see you on the next Zoom, Q- Zoom QA if you do. Oh, you also get your name in the credits. Thanks for watching. I will catch you next time.